Well, good morning, Journey Church family. Good morning, YouTube family. So happy that you are with us today as we continue uh, near the end of this preaching series for the summer of 2020. What a crazy summer of 2020 it has been. But nevertheless, we persevered uh, and have come to the next to last message in the book of James. And if you have your Bible, I invite you to open it with me this morning to the book of James in the fifth chapter. Uh, if your Bible is on your electronic device, go ahead and find that, please. And when you have it, open it. And let's stand together as we uh, share our pledge to God's Word before we pray over this message today. This is my Bible. I am what it says that I am. I have what it says that I have. And I can do what it says that I can do. Today I will be taught the Word of God. It is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It reveals the thoughts and the attitudes deep within my heart. I boldly confess that my mind is alert, my heart is receptive, and that after hearing these words, I will be a doer of the Word of God and not a hearer only. Speak to me, O Lord, your servant is listening. Let's pray together. Father, as we come once again today to the opportunity to open your word that it might speak to us, we're so grateful that you have preserved the scriptures throughout the years. We're especially thankful for this book of James, for all the practicality of it, for all the great emphasis on maturity and completeness to become to be a truly wise man and woman of God. And Father, as we talk about this very difficult challenge of being more patient. I pray that you would give us insight for the issues, the matters of our heart and our life we're dealing with today. And all of God's people said together, amen. Thank you. Please be seated. This morning, we are coming near the end of the book of James. As I said, we're in this fifth chapter, uh, and we're once again applying wisdom as we have in previous weeks to one of the most important areas of our lives, this area of patience. I was looking back through the book of James and getting ready to preach today, and I was thinking about all the subjects we've already applied wisdom to, the, the areas about our tongue, not having a forked tongue when we speak, not showing favoritism, finding wisdom in the way that we handle and appropriate money, uh, being someone more than just says the right thing, but does the right thing. And maybe in many of those areas, you could say, Mark, I've got that down. I've nailed it. But you may be one of those people today that that final missing piece uh, is this subject of patience, because patience is tough, isn't it? We spend a lot of time waiting. I read uh, the other day that um, the average American last year spent 13 hours uh, on hold on the phone waiting for customer service. Commuters across the country spend about 38 hours a year sitting in traffic. We know about that in Orange County, don't we? Accumulatively, last year, Americans, some would say wasted, more than 37 billion hours waiting in line at the grocery store, at the DMV, at the doctor's office, at the dentist's office, in traffic, uh, wherever it might be, patience is a big deal for many of us. We struggle with it. Joyce Meyer has famously said patience is not the ability to wait, but the ability to keep a good attitude while we're waiting. And you know, the truth of the matter is some of us, we do really well in our Christian faith except in this area. And I've seen some of the worst behaviors out of people that are committed to Christ when they're forced to wait. And sometimes I've been surprised and shocked. And I'm unfortunately probably one of those people who would have to be included in that group. But when you come to the Bible, patience is a, a big deal. There's more than 25 to 30 verses uh, just in the New Testament alone that talk about the virtue of patience as a follower of Christ. One of my favorite verses about that is in Hebrews 10, 36, where it says, patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that he has promised. James gives us 
three examples to help us get our arms around this idea of patience. He talks about the farmer, gives him as an example. He talks about the Old Testament prophets, says they're an example. And then he takes that unique Old Testament character, Job, who had to suffer so terribly and wait so long, it seemed to get an understanding of why God permitted that to happen to him. All of these are given to us as an evidence uh, of what patience is all about. Let's read verses 7 through 12 of chapter 5 together. Uh, Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and the spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider them blessed, those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. Let your yes be yes and your no, no, or you will be condemned. There's a lot there to get our arms around. St. Augustine outside scripture may have summed it up best that patience is the companion of wisdom. I said a couple of weeks ago to you, maybe the number one prayer that we all pray is Lord bless this mess, but probably the number two prayer we've all prayed is Lord give me patience and give it to me now. Unfortunately, that's really not how it works. Patience in the Greek is a word that comes from two words coming together, macrothumos. Macro being very long and very slow. Thumos, our word for thermal, means to heat up. And patient literally means somebody that it takes a long time to blow their top. It is the ability to hang in there and wait when patience is demanded. So what James does in the passage we've just read is he deals with three simple issues about patience. He talks about when is patience needed, he talks about why is patience needed, and he talks about how patience is applied. Let's look at those very quickly for a moment. First of all, he says patience is needed there in verse 7 of chapter 5 whenever circumstances are out of my control. This is where he introduces the idea of the farmer who waits for his precious produce of the soil. James says he's patient about it. He, he's as patient as someone waiting for the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits uh, until the rains early and late come. And um, I know a little bit about farming. Kathy and I, the first church that we ever served in was out in West Texas. And it was a church where they all grew cotton. They grow some of the finest cotton in the country. And I didn't know anything about farming. And I was amazed in the years that we were there how much I discovered the New Testament comes out of an agricultural background. And I discovered there that not all farmers were equal. Some farmers were much better than other farmers. And what I really found out about that is you can be a great farmer. You don't have to have a great education of agronomy. You don't have to have great equipment. You don't have to have a great bank account. You don't have to have uh, the greatest uh, seed. But the one thing that you absolutely have to have to be a farmer is patience. You have to be able to wait because there's so many things that are out of your control, both governmental and simply by nature and by weather. And so James says, look at the farmer. The farmer gets a crop, but he doesn't get the crop when he plants it. He has to be patient. He has to till it. He has to work it. He has to weed it. And he has to wait on it. And even after all of that, he still doesn't know if the weather is going to cooperate. The farmer, James says, is one of the best examples of what patience is all about. And then he says that patience is also about 
when people are impossible. He, he talks about the prophets uh, and he talks about what a difficult assignment they had. You and I perhaps uh, have heard about this description of some people are, are toxic people. They are the kinds of people that just drain life out of us. There's all kinds of manuals and, and assistance to help people in the workplace with those that would be called toxic. Well, nearly all the people it seems like the prophets had to deal with in the Old Testament were, were toxic kinds of people, people that didn't want to go through the change that God wanted them to go through. Uh, they didn't want to change their wicked ways. They didn't want to change their sinful behavior. They didn't want to change their rejection of the Lord. And the prophets continued and continued to be faithful to what God called. Uh, Jeremiah, as far as we know, never really saw the things he predicted and prophesied come true, but he stayed faithful. And James says, our, our prophets are example to us, like the farmers are. And then he says you need patience when life is unexplainable. And that's when he brings in the story of Job. The story of Job is one of the great enigmas of all of the scripture. Here is a man from all we can tell about him was as committed and godly as anyone there was ever in the Old Testament. He was a man enormously blessed from a family standpoint, from a fortune standpoint, in every way that you could be blessed. And in 48 hours, Job lost it all. And Job spends 37 chapters of the book asking God to explain why he had to go through what he did. And he never, ever even gets an answer. And I'll tell you, as you know, uh, in your own life, as I know in my life, there are some things that happen to us as a part of living in a broken down world that just break us, uh, seemingly knock us to our knees, cause us to wonder if we'll ever be able to go on. And sometimes we never ever here on this side of glory find the answers to that. James says Job is an example of someone who is patient. Someone who said life simply is not fair even Sliding down a rainbow, it's possible, they said, that we get a splinter. We just don't know why these things happen to us. But James says patience is so critical and so important. The reasons that we ought to be patient according to what James says here in this fifth chapter is first of all because God is in control. Even when I don't see or understand what's going on, that doesn't mean that God's not in control. James says the way we know God is in control, if you look at there in verse 8, is that James says, be patient, stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Philip's translation says it this way, resting your hearts on the ultimate certainty. And what James is trying to say is Jesus is coming again. And we don't know when it is, but it is in God's calendar, on God's timing on God's particular moment in time, he will break back into eternity and nothing in all the world will stop God from coming back into this world when he has appointed that time for it. And James would say, if that is true, that God is in control of the return of Jesus to this world, he's certainly able to be in control of what's going on in your life and in my life this morning. James would say be patient also because God will reward you for your patience. Look at there in verse 11. He says, you know, we consider blessed those who have endured. I'm reminded of what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. Blessed are you when people insult you, when they persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because, watch this, Great is your reward in heaven. Can you say that out loud with me? Great is your reward in heaven. Be patient right now because God is going to compensate. God is going to reward. God is going to bless. God is going to acknowledge the patient endurance that some of us have had to go through as a result of our faith in Christ. James would say also be patient in the Lord because he is at work behind the scenes often 
in ways that we do not see. He says about Job there in verse 11, Job's perseverance, God finally brought about the reward for that. God has always been at work and often does his greatest work in the dark. It was in the dark while Moses and the children of Israel had the Egyptians at their back, the mountains on their side, and the Red Sea before them when they were at their end where they thought it was over, that God was doing his greatest work. And, and God said to Moses, tell the people, I'm about to do something that will mean you'll never see these Egyptians again. And then he did it. The greatest work in the dark, however, that, that God ever did was after the cross. In that time of darkness, between that Friday and that Sunday morning, on Saturday it appeared that everything was lost, that all was gone, that everything had been forsaken. But the truth of the matter, God was doing the greatest work of redemption for all of eternity that assures our salvation even today. When our boys were little, they really only stood, uh, understood absolutes, yes or no. And they might say, uh, can we go to Six Flags like you promised, Dad? And I would say, yes, uh, on Friday, but no, not today. And they weren't happy because of the yes, they were destroyed because of the no. Some of us are like that. We're almost like children. We think that a delay means no, but God's delays don't mean God's denials. They just mean that God's at work in a bigger way and that his timing may be different than our timing. Philippians chapter 2.13 says, For it is God who works in you. God's working in you right now. Even though you can't see it, though you may not feel it, though you may not understand it, though you may not comprehend it, though you may not be able to explain it, it is God who is at work in you to work and act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Another later version says, God is working in you, giving you the desire and power to do what pleases him. Final thing that James says here is the what. What are we supposed to do while we wait? Well, let's close with this here. First of all, wait expectantly. Wait like the farmer expecting a harvest. Back where I was a pastor in that church, they would begin to plant sometime in the, the late spring and they would plant that seed and you would go by and look at those rows and all you would see is dirt and it would be weeks and weeks and weeks before a, a little sprig of green would would pop up but that was just the beginning it had to get up and get a, a flower on it and the flower had to turn into a bowl and the bowl had to reach to a point of completion and open up and at any point a lot of things could go wrong but the farmer believes expectantly that if I do the right things that I've learned about farming and if I will be patient and allow the land to do what it's supposed to do and the seed to do what it's supposed to do, I will find a harvest. And James says that's what patience is like. The Bible says I wait for the Lord. My whole heart waits and in his word I put my hope. Remember that Jesus says one time in Matthew 9, 29, according to your faith, it will be done unto you. How much faith do you have right now while you're waiting that God is going to keep his word and bring a promise? You say, well, I'm so tired of waiting. Well, how long have you been waiting? Jesus waited 30 years for his public ministry to begin. And it was a time when by 13 you were considered a, a man, a young man. He waited another 17 years after the age of 13. How long have you been waiting? You've been waiting 30 years for God to bring about whatever it is you're waiting on? Probably not that long. Be patient while you wait, but wait expectantly. Remember, God never disappoints. One of my favorite passages found in Isaiah chapter 49 where it says, they will lick the dust at your feet. Then you will know that I am the Lord. And those who hope in me will not, some versions say, will never be disappointed. Second thing, not only wait expectantly, but wait quietly. And James gives us two warnings here 
in chapter 5 about what not to do while we wait. Number one, don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you'll be judged. It, you know, it's amazing. While we wait, we get so discontent. We get so difficult to be around, and we start complaining. We start griping. Some of us, uh, we rise and whine every morning instead of rise and shine. Some of us hit the ground grumbling, and we never stop all day long. James says, be careful while you wait on the Lord. Don't grumble. Don't gripe. Don't complain. Don't put your burden on someone else and make them suffer for your own frustration. And second of all, he goes, watch your words. Don't swear, not by heaven, not by earth, or by anything else. I heard about the preacher who, who bought a parrot from a sailor, and the parrot was uh, sold by the pet store owner. He goes, he's a smart parrot, Pastor, but his language is terrible, and I don't think you're going to like him, but boy, he's smart. Uh, the preacher said he would take him home and he would pray with him. He would teach him scripture verses, but the parrot just kept using terrible words. The preacher kept warning the, the parrot, and finally he took the parrot and put him in the freezer and left him for 10 minutes and got him out and says, I warned you about that. I don't want to hear that kind of language from you again. And the parrot raised his wing and says, just one question. What did that turkey in there say? Well, God doesn't want us to use those kinds of words. He doesn't want us to express our frustrations like that, does he? The Bible says it's good to wait quietly for the deliverance of the Lord. Habakkuk, one of the great passages of the Old Testament, says, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak, and it will not lie. Though it tarry, watch this, say it with me, Wait for it. Though it tarry, say it with me, wait for it. Because it will surely come and it will not tarry. Some of you dialed in today not knowing what this message would be about, not knowing what God might be speaking about, but God brought you here today to hear that word right there. Don't give up on God. Don't lose your patience don't take uh, the circumstance of your heart away from God and try to fix it yourself. It's more critical than ever before. God brought you here today to hear this word. Wait on the Lord. Be patient. Tarry if necessary. Wait for it. But it will come. It will not tarry. 37th Psalm may be my favorite chapter in all the Psalms. And one of the great verses of 37th Psalm says, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way over the man who carries out evil devices. So hard to look around and see people who have no commitment to Christ, who have no allegiance to the Lord, who have no interest at all in serving him, and it seemingly seems they get blessed again and again and again. James says, don't watch them, watch the Lord. Don't fret, don't worry, don't stress, don't lose control, don't start grumbling, don't start swearing, but be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. What do you need today in your life when it comes to this matter of patience? Where does it need to be applied? How could God help you today through this teaching and through this preaching? Where do you need to get back on your knees today and say, Lord, help me to wait upon you. Forgive me for trying to take this away from you and solve this myself been over 30 years ago that I went through a very difficult time in my life. I went to see someone um, who was a follower of Jesus, and they looked at me, and God just spoke a word to them out of Isaiah 40, 31. I don't think everyone ever spoke a word to me that was so exactly right for me at that time. I knew this passage, of course. I'd sung it as a chorus as a young man. You perhaps remember it says, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. 
They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run as young men and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. He said to me, Mark, sometimes the power of God comes on us with such great force that we're like an eagle. We soar all over the skies. Sometimes it comes with us with such strength and energy. We're like a young man who can run all day long. But he says, sometimes it's all that we can do by the power of God to not fall down and quit, but to stand up, to not faint, and just to walk. You may not be able this morning to soar like an eagle. You may not be able to run like a young man, but God does not want these momentary difficulties in your life, these impatient moments to cause you to faint or to give up or to quit. Our mantra for the years at the journey is that we don't give up, give in, give out, and whatever we do, we don't quit. God's calling you and me today to be more patient than we've ever been before. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you this morning for the wisdom and practicality again of the book of James. And God, whatever is going on in the lives of those who are watching or listening to this message. I pray right now you would confirm the truth of Scripture to them. God, I pray you would quiet a, a, a restless heart, that you would soothe the soul today that feels so torn. Father, for those who are so discouraged and despondent that they want to just faint and quit, may you Restore at them a joy of expectation of your salvation. And Father, we thank you for the examples of the farmer, the example of the Old Testament prophets, the example of Job, who persevered, who stayed with the task before them and saw the reward. And I pray, God, that every one of these that are listening and watching today would soon find that blessed reward that we know is coming in your timing and in your way and in your providence. And all of God's people said together, amen. I want to thank all of you for being a part of our worship again today. How much I miss those of you there in Southern California. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know what's really going on in COVID uh, and how it's going to be lived out in Orange County, but uh, I'm committing to you today. I'm going to be there in September. I didn't get to come in August because of COVID, but we're going to figure a way to be together in, in September, either in worshiping and uh, together in our place of, of worship or something maybe out in our parking lot where everybody remains in their cars or in chairs, I'm not sure. But I will see you in September, and I want you to know how much I look forward to that, and I long 
for that. As we get ready to leave today, you become to be a part of the Journey Church Scattered. You become to be part of our hands, our feet, our eyes, our arms, our hands, our legs, but most of all, the heart and the mind of people that James is trying to get us to become to be people that are fully committed and mature in the faith and the following of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's stand together for our benediction. May the kindness of God precede you. May the wisdom of God guide you. May the light of God direct you. And may God be with us until we meet again. God bless you. Thanks for being here today.